Well, welcome everyone to uh, Crisis Conversations live from the Better Life Lab. Uh, it's a, a yet another Friday and we're all still social distancing, although some, some states and some businesses are beginning to open up again. Uh, we are still right in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about paid family leave. The United States, as many of you know, is really alone in, uh, in its peer economies, or really alone in the world, as really the only advanced economy, the only country that doesn't offer paid maternity leave after the birth of a child. We don't offer paid parental leave. We don't offer paid family leave. We leave it to the discretion of employers, so it's all voluntary. And that has huge problems to begin with. Uh, about uh, you know, 17, 18% of the civilian workforce has access to paid family leave in the best of times. Uh, and in a pandemic, when you've got families juggling, trying to figure out how to work, how to take care of their children when schools and childcare is closed, how to homeschool their children, uh, the pressures on families are really intense. So Congress did pass an emergency paid family leave law uh, which is historic and important. And yet, uh, uh, sort of at the last minute, there were a number of exemptions that were written into the bill, which leave a lot of people out. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today, that while this is a really important first step, uh, it's, it also is creating a gulf between have and have nots. Uh, and what we need to learn and what we can do to fix this moving forward. So I'd like to open today with Rebecca Gale, Rebecca is a journalist uh, based uh, here in DC, uh, and you've just written a story that was published in the New York Times where this is uh, the very issue that you explored. Like how is this emergency paid family leave um, playing out? Who is eligible? Who's using it? Who isn't? Who needs it? Uh, what, are you, what are you finding in your reporting? Well, Bridget, thank you so much for having me on. And um, like you said, this was historic. This is the first time the United States has really done something like this to sort of give this widespread, widespread federally mandated paid leave. And it hasn't really gotten the attention of everybody because most people don't even know if they're eligible. Mm -hmm. And the problem is a lot of people actually are not eligible. They were these two huge carve outs to the legislation. One for companies that have over 500 people, which is like a good chunk of the workforce, and one for companies who have under 50 people who can claim a hardship exemption. And this hardship exemption can be really anything. There's not much needed to really claim it. You can just say if allowing employees to take any sort of extended paid leave would be harmful to your business, then you don't, you don't have to offer it. But what's so interesting is, so for years, people have wanted a sort of national paid leave plan have always worked with small businesses who want to give these to employees but can't afford to do it on their own. So finally, we have a federally paid for leave because this leave is paid for by the government. It's done mm -hmm. so through a tax credit. So there's a little bit of um, a hurdle there, but there is legislation that allows it to be fronted for people who are for organizations that need it ahead of time. Uh -huh. And the problem we're seeing is that people don't know they're eligible. People who need it aren't eligible and people who are eligible are reluctant to take it because they're afraid they'll get laid off down the line or what happens when those 12 weeks are up and camps aren't open and schools aren't back. Right. So the level of uncertainty, both with regard to the workforce and with regard to the future is really preventing people, the, el the half of America who is, half of America's working force that's eligible for it. It's really preventing them from taking it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for that, Rebecca. You know, I, I want to move, um, uh, I spoke earlier uh, this week with Marissa Corbell. Uh, Corbell, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. So we have a tape uh, from our conversation. So Angela, if you could uh, get that queued up. Um, Marissa is a lawyer in Portland, Oregon, uh, works full time. Uh, her partner, her husband works full time as well for a uh, university. Uh, they have a five-year-old daughter, and she said that she was just under so much stress trying to cram 40 hours of work into a, you know, into a work day and try to do all of the child care when the child care closed and try to homeschool and do kindergarten. Uh, and she was under a lot of stress, and then she found out about this paid emergency paid family leave, and she really described it as something that, in, that really helped keep her family afloat. Uh, so can, can we pay, uh, play her clip, Angela? You write that this was like, um, you know, it offered you a lifeboat and you, you chose to climb aboard. Um, what do you think about the fact that it's only certain people that have uh, access to the lifeboat? Yeah, I think it absolutely contributed to my hesitancy and my guilt about taking 
the time. And what I had to realize for myself is that me not taking this leave isn't going to fix that for anybody else. So it's not like by taking this leave, that means that, you know, some working single mother doesn't get to take it. it it's really, they're sort of independent problems. And it's mm-hmm. frustrating and terrible that we have a system that would sort of create a, a lifeboat that really only helps, you know, people who are somewhat privileged. I work for an organization that I have, you know, happens to qualify and, you know, I have a partner, so that helps too. Like there's so many things about my life that, that made it easier for me and made me feel like, well, I'm not the person that's worse off. And so it felt weird to be taking leave, even though I knew that I was not the person that needed it the most. Um. So, um, so here's Marissa. And so she's really struggling with uh, the fact that she is eligible, she does need it, but really struggling with, with the knowledge that not everybody is going to get it. And so at this point, I want to, I want to uh, turn over to Ani Patrick. So Ani is joining us. Uh, she's a, a member of United for Respect. She also works at Aldi's. Uh, which is a large corporation and one of those with more than 500 employees who were exempted from this paid family leave. So Ani, you've got a a number of children. You are an essential worker. You have to go to work. Um, You know, talk about how you've been uh, sort of navigating all of these additional pressures. And is this, is this something that you really could have used? Um, Yes. Thank you. Uh, I really could have. I honestly didn't know anything about it um, until it was just recently brought to my attention. However, you know, as as you mentioned, I do have many children. I have four, uh, three of which are toddlers, three, four, and five, and I have a 12-year-old. So if I would have been offered this extended leave, it would have helped out a lot when I was homeschooling my children because you know we went on a stay-at-home order in March in the state of Illinois and my children were out of school and it was very difficult for me to try to juggle being a teacher on top of a mother on top of an essential worker and you know it is it is very difficult I mean being being a parent is difficult in itself but then you know, these, these educators that are not able to step in and help us out one-on-one, like, like they would love to, you know, it just, it adds that stress on our already stressful lives. And if, if I would have had a chance to take a paid leave to really truly focus on my children and their education, it, it really would have bettered the lives of not my, just myself, but my kids too. You know, so, uh, so Ani, when we were uh, talking the other day, you know, you talked about you've got four children. And we talked earlier about how the United States doesn't have, it's really the only country along with like a handful of little teeny tiny island nations in the Pacific that does not guarantee every mother paid maternity leave in the United States. Now you've had four children. Um, how did you handle that? Did you have any paid leave at all? Or what was that like? before the pandemic, uh, just in, in terms of having, starting and uh, starting a family? Um, well, at the time that I got pregnant with my three youngest children, I was working at uh, Kmart, very well-known corporation. Um, I had my oldest daughter in January of 2015, had my son in December of 2015. Wow. Now, mind you, that's all in the <laughs> wow. same year. You know, so, you know, I was off for a number of weeks that, you know, I was only part time because, you know, I had a child who was in school and things of that nature. So I only work nights Um, and me being part time, I was not allowed any kind of paid leave when I was off from my company. Um, So, you know, the first time I was off, I was able to take up some vacation time and, you know, things like that. So I wasn't completely broke. Um, You can't go collect unemployment because you had a baby, you know, they, they right. that, that's not even thought about. Right. So, you know, it was okay the first time. Now turn around and had my son in December the same year, I was off for six more months, you know, so, or six more weeks, I'm sorry. So, you know, all of that income lost really made it difficult to pay my bills. Mm-hmm. And the first time all this was going on, 
I, I was going into a place to where, you know, they were, they were talking about foreclosing on my home. Wow. Um, here I'm having babies and they're saying, Hey, hmm, you know, you're, you're going to be homeless, you know? Wow. So I was able to get some assistance with that. But then I had my youngest daughter in 2017, May of 2017, and I was still trying to get on my feet from having the other two without the income I, I desperately needed. Yeah. And I went through a second process of possible foreclosure on my home. Mm. So uh, it's very difficult. I, I feel like, you know, here we are trying to populate the world, trying to populate the United States, but the United States isn't helping us to be able to make ends meet while we are doing so, while we are healing from having children. Um, and I, it really would have been helpful because I would have, I would have not had that stress of possibly losing my home with three very young children at the time. Yeah. Wow. That's such a frightening story. Um, Ani, thank you so much for sharing that. What I'd love to do now is, you know, again, continuing on with the story. So Kelly, you know, you're, uh, you know, you're sort of on the other end of the spectrum and yet you've experienced a little bit of what, what Ani has. Um, you were saying that, you know, you and your wife, when you, you had um, brought a new child into your home, you had paid maternity leave because you live in the state of New Jersey and New Jersey is one of a handful of states that do have their own paid leave. And your wife, because she works in Pennsylvania, had no paid leave. And, you know, so that you were already struggling with that. And then, and then talk about how you've, uh, what it's been like then with the emergency paid leave and what that's meant for your family. Certainly. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to do so. So as you said, in January, my wife and I welcomed our sixth child. Wow. And <laughs> and she was able to take unpaid family leave for the first few, well, more than a few, it was close to five weeks. And we had planned and had some money saved to spend that time without her income stream. And then it was my turn to, we were able to piggyback our leave times and I took mine after her, after she did. And because mine was paid leave, we were able to sort of build up our um, reserve again, uh, you know, by no means a, a meaningful savings, but we were able to um, resume our normal lifestyle. And mm -hmm. then literally the Friday I was supposed was, that was the last day of my leave was the day everything shut down. Wow. And so we were stuck with no real answer for how are we going to make it through um, because our finances had just leveled off. And with six children, you, you do need a bit of a, a, an assurance that you're going to be able to make payments on your housing expenses and electricity expenses. So yeah. um, we scrambled and I was desperate and I, I called up my employer and I said, hey, uh, I, I, there's no way I can work. I have six kids. You know, I can't work from home. That, that's an impossibility. Um, with an infant and with two toddlers, there's no way. And uh, I said, listen, I need you to lay me off. And wow. they said, let's get back to you. And thankfully they did. And they said, hey, you can get this leave. You're eligible for it. You know, it, it, it had been a couple of weeks that passed in between where we were all figuring things out, but they called, called back and said, there's this leave. And to tell you that it goes from dangling at the edge of a cliff to just relief that your family will have electricity and food on the table. It, it's, an ex, it's an experience no one should ever have to go through. And to, to believe that only a handful of states, either six or maybe seven, plus Washington, D.C., have paid family leave, even beyond the coronavirus pandemic, that's astonishing that we don't place families at the forefront of what matters and that stability that we all need, not just for our health, but for our well-being and our mental health. You know, it, it was a true crisis for us when we looked around and said, oh my God, there's no paycheck coming our way. Mm, wow. So the Emergency Family Leave Act really did enable us to survive, not just, you know, carry on or make it through, but you know, it really was a survival issue at that point. You know, yeah. what, what do you do when you can't pay your rent for an indefinite amount of time and you're a family of eight, including yeah. a brand new baby? 
Wow. Wow. Well, Kelly, thank you so much for sharing that story. What I'd love to do now is go, go to Tanya. So Tanya uh, Goldman, um, uh, she's with the Center for Law and Social Policy, a senior attorney and uh, policy analyst, and make sure that I get your title right, Tanya, feel free to correct me. But you've been watching uh, you know, not only paid family and medical leave sort of uh, over, uh, you know, uh, in pre-pandemic times, but really looking at what's happening now um, with this emergency, um, emergency law. So, you know, what are you seeing out there in terms of, uh, you know, are you seeing these kinds of have and have not experiences? Um, are, are, you know, are, how, are, how are firms uh, implementing this? So sort of what, what are you looking at out there? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Bridget, so much. Um, so I'll echo a little bit of what Rebecca said, but we're really seeing, you know, three kind of overarching problems with making sure people can access this critical right uh, right now. The first is that millions of people are simply not eligible for the paid family leave that Congress passed. Um, and this includes a lot of essential workers. So just like Ani, there are more than 2 million workers who are employed just in large grocery store chains that would not that are not covered by the family's first law and then therefore all of them who are parents have no rights to the sort of child care leave uh, within the act wow and then the US Department of Labor took this law um, and narrowed it even further and really kind of negated a lot of what congress had been trying to do um, they've really narrowed who is eligible for the leave um, in addition to in many ways, giving small businesses almost a free pass to decide um, if they're covered by the law or not. And then the second major problem, as Rebecca also noted, is just tons of people do not know they even have uh, a right to take paid leave or paid sick days. Um, a survey that the, was done for the New York Times found that uh, nearly half of people had heard very little or had heard nothing at all mm. about their rights. Um, another poll that was done, only one in five voters said they had taken or were planning to take leave. Um, and this was just 7% just were reporting that they plan to take leave for childcare reasons, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, they are entitled, to, many people are entitled to up to 12 weeks of paid leave for childcare reasons. Yeah. And, you know, I can hypothesize about some of these reasons. You know, a quarter of them said they didn't think they qualified and that may very well be true because of the exemptions. Uh, many of them may not be able to afford a pay cut. You only get paid two thirds of your wages. Mm. And we know a lot of people can't afford um, that. And then um, I think Rebecca mentioned this also that a lot of workers just fear retaliation if they mm. take time off and it would be illegal for their employers to punish them for doing that. But we know the reality is that many workers are very fearful of that. And that really connects to you know, my third point, which is that the US Department of Labor is really abdicating its responsibility here to protect workers and help them. They just are not putting out the kind of know your rights information from mm -hmm. trusted sources in a variety of languages, in a variety of media that working people need to have to know about these rights. And then kind of doing that really robust enforcement that lets workers know if they take the leave that they'll be protected and that you know the US DOL has their back. And if I can, Bridget, I just want to add, and this is really implicit in our conversation, but this is a real gender and racial equity issue too. I mean, I think these stories, and thank you, Ani and Kelly for sharing, you know, really highlight that women are most likely to be caregivers, um, but also that many mothers are the key breadwinners in their families. And this is really true for low income women. It's true for black mothers. It's particularly true for Latina mothers but also Native American mothers um, and Asian and Pacific Islander mothers contribute mm -hmm. significant percentages to their family's income and stability. So all these women who are now caregivers and mothers and essential workers and lacking affordable childcare are really left you know, without good choices in this moment. Yeah, that's uh, such an, those are such important points. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tanya. So uh, when Tanya was talking about retaliation, uh, I, I saw Ani and Kelly, you were nodding both vigorously. So Ani, let me go to you, um, you know, in terms of, of uh, worrying about retaliation, you know, is that something that, that you, you know, why were you nodding so vigorously there? Well, I think a lot of it really has to do with, you know, that is your only source of income. And a lot of companies will say, hey, you know, don't speak poorly of us on social media or you know something of that nature. 
uh, because you are afraid to really lose your job, it, it, mm. especially in a time like this, especially with mothers and, and, and caregivers and things of that nature, you need that income. But you also need that respect and that dignity that what you're doing is the right thing and what, what this company is doing is really truly caring about their employees. You know, you need to know that you're safe, mm -hmm. but you need to know that you can speak out and say, hey, there's some injustice going on right now. Can we fix this? Mm. Without the fear of them saying, get out. Yeah. No, and Ani, you know, just as Tanya mentioned, you are also the main breadwinner in your family. Isn't that right? So then that you is this, right. So you have this yeah. additional pressure then that, you, that you're really trying to hold everything together. Absolutely. Um, my children's father actually worked for Walmart um, and he was wrongfully terminated a while back and he decided, you know what, I, we have all these children Childcare will be ridiculously expensive. So I will stay home and, and watch the children as you work. Um, with me being in a grocery store, it is very much like the retail hours that everyone speaks about. It's here, there, and everywhere. Some weeks you have more hours, some weeks you have less hours. So the instability of, you know, the fair work weeks, you know, it kind of puts a damper on him being able to even get a job because it, we don't have any other source of childcare. Mm -hmm. If there's an overlap between when I have to leave work and he has to go in. So being the sole, you know, like, as you were saying, breadwinner, it, it does add that extra stress. Yeah. So let me go back. So Rebecca, if I could go back to you, you know, so you've heard Ani and Kelly and Marissa earlier, you know, what are you, are these, do these sound familiar? What are some of the other stories that you're, that you're hearing out there? What are people experiencing? Um, it, it's what they're saying. I, I'm hearing a lot of not only do they not have the paid leave when they need it, they don't feel comfortable taking it unless their office is being or their workplace is being very forthcoming with the details and very encouraging. And even within that framework, even within people whose offices are telling them about this benefit and saying you might qualify, you should look into this. There's that fear that there's so much unknown. You know, we, you see the headlines record unemployment claims and even yeah. you know how to fill those states are dealing with people realize that they are or people are worried that if they step away from that job whether it's you know in person as an essential worker like Ani is or whether it's you know behind a screen like we're talking now that they'll be the first ones to go when layoffs come and research shows they're not wrong in fact research actually does show that the people most likely to take leave are at companies when the senior people there and the higher ups not only encourage taking paid leave but actually take it themselves too mm -hmm. and i'm not sure if we're seeing that yet in this current situation yeah yeah well thank you so much for that rebecca you know tanya to, to go back to you um you know so do we have any idea you know, is there any data about how many people are actually using this? You know, do we, what do we know? And, and do we know, is there data? Is it mainly women? You know, or Marissa, she was worried that it was mainly somebody, you know, who, who was like her with uh, resources. You know, do we have any data about whether this is, uh, who's using this? And, and is this exacerbating inequality or, or kind of what's happening on the ground? Or, or do we just not know? I think we don't know enough yet. Um, the Department of Labor really isn't able to track at this point um, the reasons you know people aren't taking leave or are taking leave. They have been able to resolve some complaints, but nowhere near the scope of the calls they're getting and the questions they're getting, which uh, suggests to me that a lot of the calls they're being told they're not eligible uh, for the leave. And mm -hmm. as I mentioned, they're you know they're letting small businesses kind of decide on their own and self-certify that they're exempt from providing it. And that wow. covers, you know, basically 90% of the firms covered by the law fall within that small business category. So that really, you know, we're just leaving out so many of the workers that it's hard, even if we had the data to get the good data. Mm -hmm. and the way we'll really know is when employers claim their, you know, as Rebecca mentioned, employers get reimbursed for this by the federal government. So the best way for us to know is, um, when IRS is able to release data on sort of who's claiming reimbursement for this. Wow, so we may not really know how this law is really working uh, until, uh, until tax time sometime a year from now, which leaves, you know, Kelly, let me go back to you, uh, you know, um, and, and we do wanna call out to the, uh, to the participants today if you have thoughts or questions or stories 
um, you know, we'd really like to, to hear from you as well. Um, you know, but Kelly, let's go back to you. You know, so you're one of the lucky haves, if you will, yes. you know, and you're talking about how this really, um, you know, you're hanging on by a thread and this sort of threw you all a lifeline. You know, in your view, you know, how would it feel? How differently would it feel if somebody like, like Ani was also able to, to uh, you know, to be eligible and, and, and to be able to, to have some kind of paid leave like this? What does it mean when, when you get this and you know so many other people don't? You know, like, like Marissa, I share that sentiment of how, how it feels to be benefiting from a, a benefits program, right, that we essentially paid into already, right, mm -hmm. um, when it comes through taxes. It, it feels to me that um, walking through this privilege and walking through my experience as someone who is already in a comfortable position, it just feels... I won't say dirty and I won't say guilty, but I just feel like this excruciating sense of loss for my sisters who don't get to participate in this program for which they're eligible, for which their service is so necessary, and for which they sacrifice a tremendous amount that's unnecessary when we live in a nation that has the means to provide for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, um, Ani, I want to go back to you, um, you know, uh, so you have uh, so many other workers, I imagine, like in, in your position, what does that feel like when you're, you know, when you're part of the ones that are left out? I feel like they may say I'm essential, but they don't treat me as such. You know, we're, we're very important. Um, you know, we are trying to grow our economy. We are trying to help people. And we, we put our lives on the line every day that we clock in, every day we walk into our, our business. And it kind of makes me feel like they're just like, oh, good job. Here's a high five. Mm. You know, it, it's like, oh, just make sure you don't get sick, you know. Like how, how can we, we do the best we can, but we all know that, you know, with, with this coronavirus, it, it sees nothing. It just does what it wants to do. And if we get sick, we get sick. Um, mm -hmm. Our stores can do so much, but I, I should feel like if I get sick, it'll be okay. My mm -hmm. family will be fine. I shouldn't feel like if I'm not feeling well, I need to still get up and go to work so I don't right. lose my job or something right. of that nature. Right. So last thoughts, Rebecca, let me go to you for closing thoughts. Um, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of discussions are out there that you're, that you're hearing what's happening on the ground in terms of what's next, because even this emergency paid leave law, it expires in December. So while it's historic, it's imperfect and it's temporary. So are there movements afoot to try to fix it now and, and fix it for, for later and for the future? There are there are movements to fix it, and I know the House is taking up something, but the Senate and the administration have indicated that they want to go further on these benefits. But we are seeing more of, in the conversations I'm having, is that there's going to be this significant mental health effect. A lot of people are reporting anxiety and stress and depression, and a lot of people are actually starting to say, wait a minute, I need to focus on my kids. I need to focus on my family. Like We can't just keep pushing them through in this current system and expect it to be okay at the end without putting in the effort now. And in my conversations I was having with people who do take leave, they're citing that as the reason. It isn't really the Zoom school. It isn't really even the hours. It's, I need to be there for my family right now. We mm. can't just put the kids in front of tablets for eight hours while we do our jobs and then expect to sit down for dinner and do this for weeks on end. And I, I hope this is very temporary and we're looking at a sea change coming this summer, but there's a lot of conversation that sh shows that might not be the case. So it's possible this conversation goes on a lot longer. Right, right. Thank you so much for that, Rebecca. It's really, you know, uh, child care centers, I mean, there was a survey um, done that about half are closed, many may not open up again. Uh, schools, it's still up in the air what schools are going to do, uh, summer camps. Uh, there's just a lot of insecurity and uncertainty for families out there still. Uh, so thank you. I'd like to thank all of you for, for joining us for another crisis conversation. Thank you so much 
to the panelists for being here, for sharing their stories and their perspective. Thank you so much to the participants in the chat. Uh, we left a number of links here in the chat and we'll, we're, we're happy to send those out again uh, to Rebecca's story, to Marissa's story. She wrote a piece uh, about her own experience in the Washington Post to a lot of the work that we do at the Better Life Lab around paid family leave, which we see as a real fundamental human right that we really need to be pushing for universally in the United States. So thank you all so much. I would like to thank my wonderful Better Life Lab team, uh, Jedziah at St. Julian, who's just a, a wonderful um, uh, backup you know, partner in this. I'd love to thank the New America um, uh, events team, uh, my producer, Dave, our producer, David Shulman. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Next week, we're going to be talking about return to work, uh, what that's gonna be like, whether you're in an office or out of an office with Alex Pang. Uh, sort of looking at short-term as well as long-term effects. So uh, in the meantime, I just heard a wonderful phrase, which I think we could all use, which is reduce the chaos uh, and be kind. So with that, thank you all so much for joining. We'll see you next week. Okay. Thank you very much.